You are using your experience teaching improv to get youth involved with advocacy. How does it enhance or make it different than other advocacy trainings you've experienced? I think the most important thing about improv is it makes you think on your feet. And when you do improv in a classroom, it kind of puts everyone on the same level, kind of allowing everyone to learn at the same, at the same place. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add that uh, I think when we think about improv, we focus on like Second City or Whose Line Is It Anyway as a strictly comedy discipline. Um, but when you apply it to life, uh, it is inherently improv. So if you go into a meeting or a, you know, testimony um, to advocate, you're, you're, you're not given a script saying this is when so-and-so will say these exact words and at this exact time, this is how you respond. Um, nor is it anarchy where you have no idea what to expect. But you are given a loose set of instructions and your ability to be successful is based on your um, keeping the conversation going forward uh, within those parameters. And that is basically improv. And that's one of the reasons we also do the named symphony uh, first, kind of just to get to know everybody, is because one of the first parts about advocacy is your name. And so we play that just to kind of put everyone on the same level and get used to just speaking up. How do the activities you use to facilitate youth advocacy workshops help them build their advocacy skills? I would say um, what by using the improv and kind of using the skills where you kind of openly have a discussion, it gets everyone used to kind of what we're going to talk about or what they're going to talk about and it just makes them more involved. I think, and leaving it open-ended with the, let's talk about your life um, and then tying it back to the games, the facilitating come, becomes... Uh, you listening to their responses and then pulling out advocacy issues from that. So not, you know, putting the pressure on the person taking the class to say, okay, you come up with advocacy issues, what's important to you right now? It's let's talk about things more in general or play this game. And in the context of the training, you can go back later and say, you know, hypothetical student, you've mentioned bullying several times. You know, is there something around that that you would like to, you know, form your testimony around? What kinds of things do you do to motivate people that are participating in a workshop? I would say um, getting everyone involved. Uh, like a lot of times we, we play games like, like the Name Symphony, like the Tone Symphony. Um, allowing everyone to speak. So not always calling on the same student at once. Maybe looking over and seeing like, oh, you're, you're really interested. You haven't spoke yet. Or sometimes just asking people like, oh, what, what do you think about this? And just trying to get every person to at least get involved in one way or another. They don't have to be involved in everything, but just one way or another. And it's not necessarily an improv game, but more of the sense of control that you can turn over to the people taking the training, um, I find helps a lot. Uh, at the beginning of any of our workshops, whether it's advocacy or um, others that we do, we start out by uh, coming up with a list of guidelines that are not predetermined by us, uh, like you see in a lot of manuals saying, respects, you know, being on time, whatever they may be, it's giving that control to the participants and saying, what is going to make you feel um, like you can share in this atmosphere and you're going to be successful um, in this next hour, in this next day, whatever it may be, and then, uh, you know, do it very democratically and having them vote on it and emphasizing the idea that everyone in this room is a teacher and a student. So you, we are as accountable for this list of guidelines as you are. Um, can be fun because it can, you know, it opens the door to be very goofy in your guidelines, but it also lets them, you know, set the framework for what makes them comfortable. During an activity, how do you work with people who feel a little bit out of their comfort zone? Well, that's the idea. Is uh, <laughs> it, um, you know, for people that feel outside of their comfort zone, uh, you know, I've had mentors tell me. Um, multiple times that we all enjoy, you know, sitting on the couch and watching our favorite movie with our favorite snack, but very rarely in life uh, do we grow in those moments. Uh, we're comfortable, certainly, but we're not growing. Uh, and it's only when we push ourselves out of that comfort zone that, uh, that growth happens. And that's scary. That can be very scary. But it's one of those things that you really need to do uh, you know, if you are going to push toward advocacy. And as a facilitator, it's going to get better with time. Uh, but that, that, that balance between pushing people out of their comfort zone 
and then also understanding what's too much in that moment. Um, you know, and the, the improv itself helps with that balance, but it is, you know, uh, understanding when someone's going to be frustrated or is on the edge of anxiety, and then you want to kind of pull that back because then the, you know, the cost benefit uh, shifts too much. But you do, you know, ultimately want them to push themselves. One of the most important skills for a facilitator is listening. Are there particular things that you try to listen for during a workshop? I would say in this case, uh, definitely the things that you'd like to advocate for. Uh, I noticed that's why we would run through kind of like brainstorm ideas of like what is an issue you'd have in a high school. We did what, what kind of things do you um, have problems with around town and just constantly be listening to those kind of things because those will give you clues to what you might want to work for or perhaps issues that are going on around your town or school. And then this, what I like, really like about this toolkit is it gives every student an opportunity uh, to both show their talents um, verbally uh, as well as, uh, you know, with writing things down in the toolkit itself. And as a facilitator, you want to pay attention to where their comfort gravitates toward. So for myself, um, you know, I'm, I'm much better at getting things out verbally uh, in the form of a verbal testimony. And then if I had to write a letter to, say, a representative, um, I could deconstruct. I could take that verbal testimony and put it in the context of a letter if I have more time um, and add the things I need to. Whereas other students that we've worked with have a different learning style. It's much easier for them to write things down in a specific way in more of a letter format and then take that and, you know, um, adapt it to, you know, a case where they would have to give a verbal testimony. Uh, so paying as a facilitator, especially if you don't have a lot of time to do both, um, completely in a, in a class, uh, you know, paying attention to each student and saying, which one are you more comfortable with? And let's focus on that for this day, because uh, we can always get better at the other one. Some people are really eager to talk when they're in a group, while others may be more shy and say very little. Do you have any tips for balancing the discussion? I would say we kind of touched on this earlier, is um, just maybe perhaps calling on kids that really haven't spoke up before or maybe using other games, allowing them to play a game that they haven't really played yet. Just any way, uh, the rules is another good one, just any way to really get them involved in the class is the best way. And, and some kids are gonna talk a lot, some are really not gonna talk at all, but it's always good to at least have the kids that really don't talk at all, at least get up and say something at least once or twice. I think sometimes we overemphasize that success means everyone participates equally. Uh, when, you know, that, you know, we're not, we're. In every other aspect, we advocate for individuality. You know, you may be a quiet person naturally, um, but that doesn't mean you're not participating fully in the class or you're not getting as much out of it. So I would say de-emphasize the, you know, the fact that everyone has to participate. But again, pushing people out of their comfort zones. So paying attention to who's playing the games and who hasn't and, you know, pushing them a little more, you know, and maybe saying, okay, uh, does someone other than Johnny have an answer. Um, or, hey, I haven't heard much from this side of the room. Um, without, you know, slamming the ruler down and being like, I have not heard answers from you, you, and, and so you don't want to be aggressive with it, but you can nudge people a little bit and say, you know, I'd really like to get something. And then, if it is a quiet person, um, or someone that hasn't com um, felt comfortable, that does share, no matter what it is, um, you know, meaning that with encouragement right away yeah. and being like, thank you, you know, um, you know, the harder it was for them to talk, the more encouragement you want to see, um, and encouraging the entire group to be supportive, uh, in our, our workshops, uh, and this is probably because we're comics and we just feel comfortable this way, but we, we applaud everything. Um, so similar to a stage performance, if somebody says something really awesome, everybody gets a round of applause. Um, and it's, uh, it's very inclusive. Same and it with, feels good. Same with after the games. Yeah. We, we applaud often after the games as well. These workshops are intended to be co-facilitated. What are your thoughts about developing a good relationship between co-facilitators for the workshops and activities to be successful? John and I did a, a, a parenting class together. Oh, that's one thing you can yeah. do. Uh, uh, there's also team building exercises. Like uh, You can practice improv with others, yourself. Um, I know that Michael and I have just bantered with each other just to get familiar on what we're going to do. 
Um, I would also say, you know, just maybe go do some, some activities, kind of like think of it like a corporate training where you just go out and maybe you go golfing, maybe you go out and enjoy a beer. I don't, I don't know. Just something along those coffee. lines. Coffee. Coffee. Yeah. If that's yeah. your jam. If, uh, and then, um, especially early on, uh, budgeting time before and after a training, yeah. uh, to, you know, get ready, um, make sure you, you know, you got a, a basic understanding of what you're trying to accomplish that day. You know, with the understanding that it might go completely different, but then building in time afterwards uh, to kind of decompress and offer each other constructive criticism or bond over the fact that nothing went right and you're never going to do this again because that was scary. Um, but building in that time um, to uh, talk about that shared experience. Because I was going to say, there's going to be times when you're teaching it that you might forget where you're at or what you're going to mm -hmm. say, and just know that you can always like post the ball over to your co-facilitator and they're there to help you and you're there to help them. How do you provide accommodations for workshop participants? So all of our, um, especially the activities in this toolkit, have gone through a vetting process of yeah. um, being uh, readily accessible for um, all abilities, all ages. So, and it may not at, at, at first glance be, appear to be, uh, um, accessible to everyone but every every one of them can be made accessible upon you know someone requesting that or self-advocating uh, for um, specifically like name symphony um, if you have someone I mean that's saying your name out loud so if you have someone that is uh, nonverbal or deaf that may be very difficult um, that's where we incorporate motion um, so you can sign um, your name or uh, decide on a body motion that you want to use. It could be, you know, both hands in the air. It could be, you know, anything like that. Um, and that's how you participate. One important thing in doing that, specifically with Name Symphony and, and any other game, is doing your best not to single people out. So in Name Symphony, when we offer a motion, you can say your name and or an emotion, you offer that to everyone. So you don't say, well, you're the deaf person, so you, everybody else gets to do it this way. We'll modify this for you. You offer it to everybody, and then um, you've made it inclusive. And it's, it's still entertaining, and it adds another visual aspect uh, for the audience that is, uh, adds to the game. As far as uh, if, take someone that's visually impaired um, for the same game, because you, know, you have to have the ability to see what the... Uh, in, uh, conductor in this case is doing a few things you can do just off the top of your head um, that we've done in the past partnering them with a co-facilitator yeah. to be right next to them to offer that um, audio description uh, or if it's just saying your name um, getting some kind of touch cues uh, where if I touch your arm you know on the bottom that means go higher if I touch it on the top that means go lower um, and working that out ahead of time. What tips do you have for others who want to conduct these workshops but who don't have experience with improv or these types of group activities? Take a class or find an opportunity to work on these skills yourself. Um, John and I both have done improv as students for a very long time before we ever, um, and stand up before we ever did, uh, taught other people. Uh, the, the benefit of it that we, and we tell all of our uh, every all of the stand-up comics uh, that we work with, as well as the people that we have going to schools, you know, if you have a base in improv um, or some kind of performance, it's going to make you that much better a teacher. And it's really that that relationship with the audience that we found most important um, versus a traditional teacher um, in education is a comic or a performer views an audience as someone that you need to adapt to. So not the other way around. The audience never, you know, um, the audience doesn't have to understand you. You have to take every individual as a different audience. And your job as a performer is to do what you need to do to make them understand what you're trying to do um, and be able to adapt to that and not judge them for, you know, a label or you know, perceived level of function, which is a term that we really don't use around here. It's, you know, whatever that may be, it's not your job to understand us. It's our job to understand you. 
That's what I would say stage time. Anytime you can speak in front of people, anytime, whether it's like an open mic, maybe it's like a rotary club or like a lion's meeting, just anytime you can get up in front of people and be comfortable knowing that you have to speak in front of people who might not talk or anything like that, that is the best way to just get in front of people and not be. Okay. Toastmasters. Toastmasters, uh, yeah. I've heard is very good. Uh, what improv adds that I, I don't know that those other things do um, is the when things go wrong. Mm-hmm. Like training yeah. that muscle. Yeah. So I know a lot of those other speaking and, you know, taking public speaking courses in college. It was a very, uh, you know, PowerPoint driven or, you know, note cards. But what happens when the PowerPoint doesn't work or the note cards, you know, get coffee spilled on them? Then what do you do? Um, an improv, you know, kind of helps you iron out that skill before you get in front of people. Or in case in this uh, kind of training, like let's say you, you realize you're running low on time and you only have a certain amount of time, what do you do then? And that's what improv kind of leads yeah. to. Is like, say okay. one of your co-facilitators yeah. rants a lot. Um, yeah. And you just nip that in the butt. What other things are important to share about conducting these types of workshops? So a couple more quick uh, facilitator sip tips in regard to accommodating different individuals uh, in the context of the games, especially the improv games, specifically uh, uh, tone and name symphony, as well as the debate. Um, certain individuals, whether it be because of uh, issues with anxiety or uh, you know, even different diagnoses that uh, are very sensitive to uh, sound, and especially uh, sound at a certain level, to accommodate these, um, in these games, where we're asking people to be loud. Uh, we can go to um, what's referred to as like a stage whisper. So rather than um, saying my name as loud as I can, Michael, uh, which can be triggering uh, to a certain individual, you would use the same aggre- like positive, aggressive tone, um, but whisper shout. So, Michael, Maya, or Maya. Um, which individually isn't that loud, but if you're having a group whisper shout at the same time, can achieve the same effect. Um, and in regards to tone, uh, taking an extra moment, and again, you've, you've known these people for a little bit, um, gotten to know, you know uh, them as individuals. So if you feel like there is someone um, uh, who may not be able to differentiate between uh, pretending uh, we're pretending to be aggressive and insult people uh, versus, you know, we, the, you know, I think this is actually happening. Um, or if somebody self-advocates and says, you know, this is triggering for me, um, the aggressive kind of tone, which for a, a lot of people may be. Uh, you know, either you're know, using that improv in your own act and uh, deleting it completely, maybe just talking about it, or, you know, saying to the audience and reassuring them, you know, we are pretending, and this is the outcome. This is why we're doing this um, and acting this way. Um, and we're not just doing it for, you know, for the sake of doing it, but explaining why it's happening can also be, uh, go a long way toward uh, um, not having it be a, a, a negative experience for people. Um, and again, practice makes perfect, um, uh, and uh, you'll get more comfortable the more often you do it. But those are some things you can keep uh, keep an eye out for. 